Hello, this is Dr. Sharon Christman with Clinic Reviews. Clinic Reviews is an NCLEX, three-day NCLEX review program that you can take online or in person. So go to clinicreviews.com to register for one of our reviews. The YouTube channel, we focus on things that we don't uh, talk as much about or sometimes we don't talk at all about in our clinic reviews. And the three-day clinic review is really what you need to pass NCLEX, but there's always more that you can learn and sometimes people feel they need more. So that's the purpose of, of the YouTube channel. And also to just encourage you, maybe just talk about nursing stuff. So that's what we're gonna do. So today we're gonna talk about anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression are often, often diagnosed together, but I find that on NCLEX questions, they tend to be treated separately. And so we're gonna talk about them as sort of like two separate things. So let's first talk about anxiety. Anxiety um, has some different levels. We have mild, moderate, and severe anxiety. Mild anxiety is considered a healthy level of anxiety. It actually helps you focus more. Um, it allows you to um, become more attentive. Uh, you have better problem solving it with your brain is, is more kind of firing. It kind of stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. And it often motivate, motivates people to get up and do some work, right? Maybe you're a Maybe you're a last minute person, like I'm a last minute person. And the reason I think I'm a good last minute person is because I develop mild anxiety. Like if I know I have an assignment due tomorrow, I can focus on it today really, really well and get it done really quickly because my mind is focused on it. And so I've always done well, like people would say, well, you're a procrastinator. I'm not really... I mean, I guess I am sort of a procrastinator, but I think I function better with mild anxiety and I don't start to feel mild anxiety until like I get close to the deadline. And so uh, if some of you are probably like that and mild anxiety allows us to be more focused and to actually do work more quickly and, and to process things. So mild anxiety is considered a healthy thing. Once you get up into a moderate level of anxiety, that's not considered nearly as healthy. The person feels like there's something wrong um, and they often can, um, although they can still process information, they sometimes need help from other people to problem solve how to solve the problem. So once you get into a mild level of anxiety, um, you actually start um, not processing information very well, nearly as well. Not, well, you can process the information, but you have trouble solving the problem. So I was watching the other day one of these videos on um, airline passengers who are late to, to to the gate and so they miss their flight and it's definitely not a mild level of anxiety you can tell there's something different people re you know respond differently but you can tell there's at least a moderate level of anxiety when you get to the gate and you realize you're not going to get your flight right and sometimes the plane is still there and you're like why can't you let me on like well, it's, it's the tsa says we're not allowed to let you on well what I'm standing right here. The plane hasn't taken off yet. Let me on the plane. No, we can't. We're not allowed to. It's against the rules. It's like, this is ridiculous, right? And so you can tell people have this moderate level of anxiety, and they're not sure how to solve this problem. Over at the ticket desk, a mother and her two sons have arrived late and missed their flight to San Diego. I don't want to stand by. I want to be, I, I want to have an assignment on a flight. I'm supposed to be at work. Sharon McInerney and her sons could be in for a long wait for the next flight. If there's nothing at 9.15, we have to stand by the whole damn day. Check another airline for me. American West, any place, anything. Just check another airline for me. I want to get out of Chicago. Okay, look, our flight was supposed to leave in 10 minutes and we missed our flight and they got nothing available. All day, you know? I'm going to miss a whole day at work for this? They're not necessarily at a severe level of anxiety yet, but they definitely are struggling with how to solve the problem. Because sometimes people are like, well, I have a connection, or I have to get there for this wedding, or my child is going to be playing a big baseball game, i got to get there. And so they're feeling a lot more anxiety over this, and they're struggling to solve problem solve. And so sometimes they need the gate agent to be really like, you know, hey, we can you can leave in two hours on this other flight. And they can't even... Like they struggle to even see how that is going to resolve the problem, right? They need help saying, okay, like two hours is not that big of a difference. Like we can get you there. It's just going to be a little bit later. So that's something that, that can sometimes uh, be a problem. And then we get into severe anxiety. Severe anxiety, people definitely, there's definitely something wrong. And everybody can tell there's something wrong because they start to have physical symptoms. They become irritable. They can start to become angry. Theoretically, 
And when I say theoretically, I mean we theorize this because you can't really see it happening, but we, we do really think this is, this is what happens, is that severe anxiety is the, um, the underpinning for violence and panic. So people become severely anxious, and when they can't get their anxiety resolved at that high, severe anxiety level, if they can't get their anxiety resolved and get calmed down, they're either going to panic or they're going to become violent. We are going to be on a flight. I warn you, we are going to be on a flight because we were told by your own people yes. that we were okay. So you take responsibility and you get us on the flight. Unfortunately, there is no unfortunate. You are unfortunate. And one of the things you have to realize as an NCLEX test taker is if they're talking to you about a person who's severely anxious, you have to be thinking they're either going to panic or they're going to become violent. And that is what they're testing on whether I know that. And I have to take action to address one of these, them not becoming one of these two things, right? We don't want them to panic. We don't want them to become violent. And so they start to become restless. They start to become irritated. They may be pacing. They may be mumbling under their breath. What you don't expect is them to be pounding against the wall. You don't expect them to be throwing chairs, right? If they're throwing chairs and pounding on the wall or threatening to hit you, they're already crossed over into that violence level. And I don't know if they do training with these airline uh, folks to say, here's how you respond to them, because they did a pretty good job responding to folks. Some of these airline the people behind the desk, right? The ticket agents, they did a pretty good job because what you have to do when people are severely anxious is you have to stay calm yourself. You cannot allow the person who's anxious to, to increase your anxiety, right? Because that's just going to make things worse. So you have to stay calm and you have to be very matter of fact. This phrase matter of fact means just the facts, ma'am. Just give me the facts. There's no emotion behind what you're saying, you're just saying the facts. And sometimes you have to repeat those things several times because the person you're talking to is not processing well and they're having trouble figuring out how to solve the problem. So, you know, you're just giving them the facts. We will book you on another flight in two hours. And they're going, how can you not let me on the flight? Da, 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 da. We can book you on the flight in two hours. Please stop yelling at me. We will book you on the flight in two hours. So you can, you can, Tell them what to do. In fact, telling them what to do is sometimes a good thing because they don't know how to act. They're not, they don't know how to solve the problem. See, that's, that's the issue is they do not know how to solve the problem in and of themselves. They have no problem solving skills at this point. And so we have to either solve the problem for them or help them solve the problem. Okay. And so, and then if they end up getting towards this kind of violence side of it, then we'll talk a little bit about what you do when, when they end up with uh, a violence is the issue. So anxiety, for the most part, when you get anxiety questions, they're either looking for you to respond in a way that helps. Like, so if it's, at a, if it's at a moderate level of anxiety, you want to help them problem solve through it because they're going to be struggling to problem solve, right? So you want to help them problem solve through it. But if they end up at a severe level of anxiety or a panic level, you have to be matter of fact and give them short direct, short directions, short directive statements. Sharon, sit down. Sharon, stop yelling. Sharon, I'm going to look and see when the next flight is I can get you on. And using their name also is a way to get their attention because they're starting to spiral, right? They're panic, they're gonna go down this panic loop and you've got to get their attention and saying their name is sometimes a good way to do that. And so these are the kind of things, and it doesn't always sound super therapeutic because we tend to think of therapeutic communication as like open-ended questions, showing empathy. I'm so sorry about this. But when someone's severely panicked, you can show empathy. You can say, I'm really sorry about this, but, you, but that's not going to solve the problem, right? It's not going to solve the problem. That's not all they need. They need you to be directive and they need you to be problem solving. And, and sometimes if they end up in a up down going down the violence direction, if it says they're, they're starting to slam things, they're slamming doors, they're pounding the walls, they're pounding on the table, they throw a chair, they haven't hurt any person yet, but they're starting to, they're moving in that direction. You need to isolate them. Isolation is the best way to get someone to de escalate and there's levels of isolation one level of isolation is i can move them into another part of the same room so here's all the people right and they're highly anxious and i say let's move you over here 
And you see that sometimes when you watch these videos with these flight ticket agents, because I think I wonder how much training they've had because they can move that person out, right? Let's get you out of the main area. Let's get you over here and we'll talk to you over here. See, that's a form of isolation because you're getting them away from all of the things that are starting to panic them, getting them away from all these stressors, all this, they're, they're having constant um, noises and talking and stuff. And it just, it doesn't help them. That's why in the hospital, one of the best ways to help to try to de-escalate is to, to remove them from all the sounds, turn off all the buzzing, right? Get them away. Just move them away to a quieter area. Now, if you can't, now you're not going to see this much like in ticket agents, right? At the, at the airport, but I'm talking now from a nursing perspective. If we move them to a different part of like you're in a big room, like in your psych unit or whatever, you move them over here and that doesn't help. There's another level of isolation. We can move them to another room by themselves. It may be moving them outside maybe by themselves, but you're getting them away completely away from everybody else. So you're moving somewhere where they're away from everybody else. That's the second level of isolation. And then the third level of isolation is moving them to their room. But what you want to do is you want to, you want to reduce all this stimulation. Okay. So your first thought when someone's getting violent is not to automatically take them down. Like if you're afraid they're going to become violent, we're not like, okay, we're going to take them down. Get five people. We're going to take them down. Like if we have to take people down, that is failing. We don't want to do that. That is not our first choice. Okay. So we don't want to have to do that first. So when you think, when you get a, uh, anxiety question, you're thinking, how can I de-escalate this situation? And de-escalating the situation is either going to involve direct matter-of-fact statements or questions. It's going to get, it's going to involve moving them out from all the other stimulation. It may say, remove all the external stimulation. It may say, move them to another room. It may say, take them to their room, whatever. Those are all things that are appropriate um, before you end up having to take them down. Okay. So that's, anxiety. Now, you can treat anxiety with medications, but I would not ever choose that as the first option. Okay, don't choose medication as the first option. So we have a couple different types of meds. We can give minor, minor tranquilizers, minor tranquilizers like benzodiazepines, lorazepam, which is Ativan, um, Valium, which is, oh, what is the name of Valium? Diazepam, I think, diazepam is Valium. So you can give minor tranquilizers that you can do that. You can give major tranquilizers like Haldol. Okay, Haldol is a major tranquilizer. Or you can move them into a quiet room away from everybody else. If you have a choice, someone's feeling, let's say someone is, is starting to feel highly anxious, highly anxious, and it says, which is your best response? Or what is their best response? Or what are you going to teach them to do, right? And it says, you're going to teach them to take their Haldol. You're going to teach them to take their Ativan, or you're going to teach them to move away into a quiet room. And what's the first response? What's the best? What not best? What's the what's the first thing that you should do? And you go, well, I'm going to move them into a quiet room because I'm always going to do uh, behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. If I can do cognitive behavioral therapy before I start giving them people medications, and that's what I'm going to choose to do. So cognitive, cognitive being brain, behavioral movement. So it's changing how you think, changing how you act as a therapy for treatments, okay? So some of the things that we can do to treat anxiety, uh, a lot, so behavioral therapy is moving away and getting out of the, the area where you're anxious, okay? So that's behavioral therapy for anxiety. Now, cognitive therapy for anxiety is changing the way they think. So a couple words they may use would be reframing, Okay, reframing, positive reframing. So, so instead of saying, instead of saying, I'm such an idiot, I can't believe I failed my boards. I'm such an idiot, I can't believe I failed my boards. See, that's a very negative way of saying that, right? Instead of saying that, you say, well, I didn't pass my boards. I'm going to look at my results. I'm going to figure out where to start, and I'm going to pass it the next time. So, you might go, well, okay, so so what? Well, those are major differences in reframing, major differences in reframing. I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I didn't pass. That's a, that is a cognitive thought, right? That's a thought you're having that is not as a very negative thought versus, okay, I didn't pass. I'm going to look at my results, see where I didn't pass, and I'm going to start there for studying, and I'm going to pass the next time. That's a cognitive reframing. How about someone who maybe struggles with abandonment? Maybe they were, maybe their mother 
was a drug addict and uh, perhaps she either died when they were young or she had to give them up when they were young. And so they say, I, I can't believe my mom abandoned me. Um, I don't know what I did. I don't know why she didn't love me, right? That's a, that's a one way of thinking versus my mom was a drug addict. She was uh, unable to control her behavior. The addiction was in complete control of her life and her behavior. But if she had had control of her life, I know she would have kept me. It was the addiction that caused her to behave the way she did. It was not what I did. I did nothing to cause her to behave that way. Do you see the big difference? What did I do to cause my mom to abandon me versus my mom had an addiction problem? What I did had nothing to do with why she left. Had nothing to do with why she left. Those are, that's a major cognitive reframing. So that's co positive cognitive reframing. Um, we also, they also do what's called decatastrophizing, catastrophe, catastrophe. Catastrophe is a major bad event, right? Tornado takes your house down. It's a catastrophe. And so there are people who catastrophize everything. They get a divorce and their life is over. I feel my NCLEX. I'm never going to be a nurse. I'm an idiot. I can't ever pass anything. Why can't I ever pass anything? I'm never successful at anything that I do. See, that's catastrophizing, not passing the NCLEX, right? So instead of catastrophizing, you decatastrophize it. Okay, let's put it into more realistic terms. Instead of making not passing the NCLEX a catastrophe, let's say, okay, I didn't pass a test, but I passed many tests in the past. In fact, I passed my entire nursing program. So clearly I passed some tests in the past and I've been successful at a lot of stuff in the past. Otherwise I wouldn't be where I am today. And so this is not a catastrophe. This is a, I failed the test, but I am going to pass it. That's decatastrophizing. So that's another type of cognitive behavioral therapy. And then relaxation is always a good thing. Breathing techniques, relaxation, and Clix likes that stuff. And Clix likes that. Breathing, relaxation, and you may go, you, you may not, for me, I don't teach that kind of stuff much. Like I don't teach breathing techniques and relaxation maybe because I don't do it and so I don't think to teach it. But it doesn't matter whether you use it or whether you teach it or not. NCLEX likes it. It's a non-medical, non-medicine therapy for anxiety and they like that. Okay, so keep that on your list of interventions for anxiety. All right, now let's talk about depression. Um, depression is a mood disorder. It's a mood disorder, and it's characterized by clearly a change in mood, so a depressed mood, right? Depressed mood means they don't have any interest in anything, so they've lost interest in things they normally would be interested in. It's also characterized by sleep disturbances that could either be insomnia, the inability to fall asleep, or oh, sleeping more than usual, sleeping hours and hours during the day when normally they would not be doing that. It also often is associated with thoughts, negative thoughts, th thoughts of worthlessness, um, feeling like uh, they'd be better off dead and so forth, right? Suicidal thoughts is fairly common associated with depression. It also has physical symptoms, uh, fatigue, changes in energy, and aches and pains. It's, it's an interesting um, but common Pain, uh, um, symptom associated with depression is they just don't feel good. I just, I'm exhausted. I just, I feel like my joints are cracking every time I move and I'm just, oh, I just don't feel good. I can't concentrate. It's a loss of concentration. All I want to do is sleep. But every time I go to sleep, then I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I can't go back to sleep. I'm worthless. I would be better off dead. I don't eat anything. It's often associated with eating changes often associated with not eating, but it could be anything. So it could be more sleep or less sleep. It could be more eating or less eating. Okay, so eating changes, sleep changes, thoughts of guilt, thoughts of worthlessness, suicidal ideation, changes in energy, changes in ability to concentrate. All right, so how do we treat? Well, how, how does NCLEX treat depression? So someone who's diagnosed with depression, do you know what I see? Honestly, what I see most often on the NCLEX is medications. And the last time I did a... Um, psych video. It was on antidepressants, psych and, and drugs, psych and um, farm. I did that specifically because antidepressants are, are pretty strongly tested on boards. So I have a whole video on that. So I'm not going to talk much about antidepressants, but that is a common way to treat depression. So if it's not a psych med question, it's usually then going to be 
um, a question that the person's already been on their medications for a couple weeks because those first two weeks, if you remember the, the last video on this that I made, the first two weeks you're watching for suicide because they start to get their energy back in the first two weeks, but often their thinking is not better. So you're watching for suicide the first two weeks. Once you hit that two to four week mark, they're starting to feel better both physically and cognitively, and you can actually start to do cognitive behavioral therapy. So a lot of the same strategies, cognitive behavioral therapy, positive reframing, decatastrophizing, and also talking with them about going places of behaving in a way that doesn't lead them back kind of down this dark path that they may have been on. So self-care, making sure you get enough sleep, making sure you eat enough, maybe getting away from some of the toxic relationships that you might be in. So these are all these are all some things that they can start to talk about once they're feeling better, which is why antidepressants are so strongly tested on the NCLEX because typically for depression, we medicate, we let the medication kind of take over and then we start doing some cognitive behavioral therapy. They may eventually be off the medication, but it's pretty common to have them on medication at least in a, for a short period of time, maybe three months um, until we can um, do some cognitive behavioral work and they may be on depressant, antidepressants the rest of their life. They don't have to be, but they might be. So then what are some other good nursing interventions for a patient who is recovering from depression or even in some of the early more depressive symptoms? What do we do? Well, do you remember how we talked about how you've learned about therapeutic use of self, therapeutic use of self? This is a really good intervention for people in the earlier stages of depression when they're still um, really not talking much. Uh, so they're not quite ready to begin those cognitive behavioral therapy changes yet. And we can use therapeutic use of self. So we can just sit with them. Um, we don't force them to talk, but we can encourage them to talk. And if they don't want to talk, we can sit with them. Uh, what we don't want to do is just say, yeah, sorry, see you later. Just go ahead and sit in there till you feel better. So we don't just leave people alone. Like I'm talking inpatient psych here. We don't just leave people alone to isolate themselves in the room forever um, until the medication takes effect, right? We give them their antidepressants, see you tomorrow, right? We don't do that. So therapeutic use of self, check on them frequently, encourage them to participate in group. We don't force them to participate in group while they're still severely depressed, but we encourage it. We can encourage them to come down to the activity center. We don't force them to do those things. We can sit quietly with them. Um, and, uh, those are some really good things. We can acknowledge the feeling. I, um, you must be feeling really discouraged right now and so forth. Watch for suicide, um, watch for improving behaviors and coping because so what are the, the symptoms? I'm right. Poor sleep. So if it says, what are you watching for? Well, you're watching for improved sleep. Um, if they have poor appetite, you're watching for them to increase their appetite. Um, if they're um, totally isolating themselves, you're watching for them to be coming out of the room more often without having to ask them to do that. Um, we want to notice if they're having more positive thoughts and we're, we're not forcing conversations with them. Now, here's some things that you don't want to do. These are not good things. And these are true with all psych, really generally speaking in psych, but these are particularly true with anxiety and depression. Okay, so don't ask why. Why are you feeling like that? Look, Nobody knows why they do what they do, honestly, especially when they're severely anxious. They don't know why they're screaming at the top of their lungs. They just, they don't know what else to do. They can't problem solve. Or for people who are severely depressed, why are you sleeping all day? I don't know. I just can't get out of bed, right? Don't ask why questions. That's never therapeutic. Don't give gifts. And that includes compliments. So if you're, um, you've got a site question, you're not sure what the right answer is. You're not sure what the right answer is. So you're sort of guessing and you're like, okay, I'm going to rule out the things that are not good to do. Rule out the why. It says, why? Oh, I'm not going to do that. Or if it says, that's a nice shirt you're wearing. See, that sounds really, really innocuous. What I mean by that, it doesn't seem like that big a deal, right? Because I may at work, I make frequently say to a colleague, hey, I really like that shirt you're wearing. You got a new haircut. I really like that, right? We do compliment each other. It's a fairly regular part of our conversations, but you don't do that in psych. As psych nurses, you have to act like a psych nurse. If you're taking a psych question on the NCLEX, you have to think like a psych nurse. And we don't give compliments in psych. We don't give any gifts, but compliments is considered a gift. Don't give advice. If they ask you what you would do, you say, 
What do you think? What are you thinking about doing? What would you like to do? Right? You ask them, you reflect that back on them. You never, and you never turn it back on yourself. Well, you know how I felt when that happened to me. Never, never, never turn everything back on yourself. You want to keep the focus on the patient. So rule out those answers where you're turning the focus back on yourself. Don't ever get a, get a, give a guarantee. If you do this, then this will happen. That's not good. If you see the word guarantee in the question, in the answer, it says, it says guarantee them this. You go, I'm ruling out the guarantee. If it says guarantee, I'm not, not picking it. That's not a good NCLEX answer. Um, don't use platitudes. Platitudes are like, oh, honey, everything will be okay. Or, um, well, the grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence. Okay, that's a platitude. And um, definitely keep the focus on the client and choose immediacy over putting it off until later. So if you have the option to, to address it now, that's better than saying we'll talk about it tomorrow. So again, if you're if you're just ruling out answers, you're like, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I'm going to rule out or I'm going to cross off things that are not therapeutic. You're like, yeah, I'm not going to choose a platitude. I'm not going to put it off if I can deal with it now. I'm going to keep the focus on the client. I'm not going to ask why. I'm not going to give compliments or any other type of gift. I'm not going to give them advice and I'm not going to give them a guarantee. All right. So um, we'll have some more videos coming up where we practice some of these strategies. And I hope you have a really great day. Thanks for watching.